Olá pessoal, sejam muito bem-vindos e bem-vindas a mais um conteúdo do Summit Firjan IEL e Festival Futuros Possíveis 2020 da Casa Firjan. Se você está acompanhando a gente, você já sabe que eu me chamo Karen de Souza, sou jornalista, estou com você por aqui nesse evento. E agora a gente traz mais um conteúdo bastante relevante para vocês, para que você curta, viu? Olha, em função do fuso horário, o nosso próximo palestrante que vive na Índia não pôde estar com a gente ao vivo. Por isso essa palestra foi gravada, pré-gravada especialmente, né, junto também com uma sessão de perguntas e respostas que a equipe da curadoria do evento organizou antecipadamente. Então você vai ouvir agora o PHD em Filosofia pela Covenant University da Nigéria, consultor da Unesco e diretor executivo da The Emergency Network, Bayo Akomolafi. Hello, I greet every one of you at the Possible Futures Festival happening in Brazil, um, organized by Casa Verjan. Uh, my name is Bayo Akomalafe, and I have been invited to share a few words with you about the future, about possible, desirable futures. Um, I want to stay with a question. Um, particularly revolving around how we create new futures and what that might invite us to consider, what, what it means to rethink the colonial stretch of the present that we rudely call the future. I'm here with my family in India, um, where I live and make my home, um, but I'm from Nigeria and Nigeria has a fascinating co-history with Brazil. I want to tell a bit of a story as I begin to explore something of a topic or a question around um, why we are so stuck and what it might take to unravel the future, what it might take to proliferate multiple futures. Um, I visited Brazil many times in the past, and I remember I was in a favela in Rio de Janeiro, and I was introduced to a doll, a, a rag doll, a black rag doll, and I was told that the name was Abayomi. The name of this doll is Abayomi, generically. Now, it turns out the name of my son is Abayami, and the name of my father is Abayami. So I was taken aback, surprised by this, by this event. Why would you name a ragdoll Abayami? And then I learned the histories, why it came to be known as Abayami. Turns out that on one of those slaving expeditions, taking millions of bodies from the Bight of Bini in West Africa, um, across the Atlantic in the Middle Passage to the Caribbean and the Americas and to Brazil. Brazil received the bulk of um, Afro-descendants and, um, and has the unfortunate you know, uh, privilege, if you will, of, of having the largest slave port um, in the Valongo, uh, slave port, which is at one time the biggest in the world. Well, on one of those expeditions, it is said that a woman came on board with child, and her child, as you might imagine, was uncomfortable. This wasn't just flying economy class. This was a slave ship. It was a vessel of misery. It was a dungeon on the ocean. Um, and all the carceral politics have been immobilized with other bodies on a floating dungeon um, came into play. And this child was uncomfortable. Um, the mother could not comfort the child. The mother could not appeal to the child. But this was her child. And what could she do? I believe that in a moment of insight that was more than human, she got inspiration to 
tear her dress into two and to weave out of the fabric, out of the shreds, a rag doll. And it is said that for a moment in time, she was able to appease the child, bring unprecedented hope in the sight of hopelessness to this child. And the child was able to be comforted. And she named the rag doll a biomi. A biomi is a long or a shortened form, actually, of a longer name, of a longer story. Yorubas give names that are stories, epic stories, or rikis. And a biomi actually comes from a story that is that designates the following or signifies the following, that they thought they had buried me, but they did not realize that I am a seed. Um, literally, it means the enemies would have conquered, would have killed and conquered. Uh, but God was on my side. Um, and so this ragdoll was a story, was a way of saying um, that I prevailed. And that there is sometimes hope, even in the most hopeless of circumstances. But there's more to the notion of a biomy that I'd like to share. I feel a biomy is a site of rupture, a site of disjuncture, a, a site of discontinuity. In the colonial vessel of the slave ship, another body was born. Uh, not a human body this time, a more than human body. A biomy, the rag doll, became a figure of promise. And, you know, the story is told where I come from, that the trickster Eshu, who is known across the Atlantic too as Eshu, traveled with the slaves across the Atlantic. I believe that one of the forms that Eshu took was a biomy. And in so doing, he upset the colonial dynamic um, of economic transactions that formed the transatlantic slave trade. Issue disappointed the idea that the slave ship was a total vessel of oppression. And he inserted a very, very small seed, a small insight, a small flash of messianic promise. And what was that? That the future is not all there is, that there are other ways of thinking about ourselves in the world. I think of Abayomi as the rejection of the future. Now you might say, well, well it, that doesn't make sense. Well, let me explain. I think the future, in the ways that we modern citizens have been conditioned to speak about it, is a colonial invention. I think the future is an invention of enlightenment, renaissance, western modernity, white politics. The future is usually framed as an extension of the present, as a means to predict the future or, or predict the next, if you will. Language fails me. Um, the dream of Western uh, modernity um, has always been to stabilize the world so that it is um, amenable to selves to human selves, to human individuals, so that it works for human individuals. White modernity is about rationalizing the planet. And this dream of rationalizing the planet exists together with the attempts for scientific determinism, for universality, for um, predictability and control. The dream is to extend this colonial territory so that it covers all the planet and possibly progressively the entire universe if it has the means so that we have every atom, every molecule, every protein, every amino acid, every morsel of the next, every morsel of the yet to come in our grasp so that we can determine and fixate or stabilize ourselves as permanent fixtures of the universe. 
In that sense, the future is an extension of colonial might. And not just of colonial might, the future is part of the assemblage of human presence. What do I mean by that? When we think about the human, we usually think about embodied beings like ourselves, bipedal structures, uh, you know, one head, two eyes. That's the usual idea of the human. But the human is much more than just um, a being. The human is a territory. The human is a way of acting in the world. The human involves extraction capitalism. It involves the transatlantic slave trade. It involves the proliferation of cities and settlements. It involves the wiping away of indigenous communities. The human is a presence on the planet that has fostered a way of being in the world that has led us to what we now call the Anthropocene. The human is a certain spatial temporal dynamic, a way of framing time that is linear, predictable, controllable, knowable, determinable, you know, um, intelligible. That is where the future comes from. The future comes from a territory a colonial invention, which is the human. And it has led us to troubling places. This effort to stabilize the world, to determine what might come next, is what has led us to the Anthropocene, to toxic, poisonous environments, to deletions of our lives, to the wiping away of territories and other worlds. And every time we come up against um, innovation, every time we ask questions about what can we do next that is creative, that is unheard of or unprecedented, most of the time we're caught within this human assemblage and we're just reproducing um, what we already know, what we already desire, what we already feel is possible. So here's what I want to stress that the future is not just a durational concept. The future is not just a spatio-temporal concept. The future is anticipatory. The future is a particular way of behaving with the world, meeting the world, naming the world, categorizing the world, indexing the world. The future is a way of naming ourselves. When we go to the uh, supermarket, and buy food and groceries, that is a way of performing the future. When I say the future is anticipatory, I mean the future is already here. The future isn't just down the street or down the clock or down the calendar. The future is here with us. We perform and enact the future in the ways we choose to notice some things and in the ways we choose to exclude other things. When we frame politics as the work of partisan politicians and representational politics, that's the way we frame and construct the future. When we think about schooling and education as a factory industrial process that puts kids you know, through a dynamic and produces jobs and access and more money and growth you know, and infinite growth and development, you know, that is a way of performing the future. Right here in the present, we co-create and secrete the future. And that is why the future is much more than something down the line, much more than a, much more than a durational spatio-temporal concept. It is an anticipatory, spiritual, metaphysical, epistemological, philosophical, ecological way of being in the world right now. So my question then is, if the future is anthropocentric, if the future is a creature, a product of the human, which is a territory, are there other ways we can shapeshift? Are there ways we can speak about post-humanist futures? I feel there are. I feel that this is a time for decolonial temporalities. This is a time for us to run away, exile ourselves from the plantation, 
the slave cotton plantation that proliferates a certain kind of temporality, the kind that dismisses the past as already done with and the future as down the line. That architecture creates the kinds of troubles we're meeting with. And that is why we need different kinds of temporalities. But to get to that, we need to shape shift. We need to attend to the modern human. We need to build wilder coalitions and wider coalitions. Um, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze um, speaks about thinking as a becoming monster, as a becoming otherwise. That is, to think, well, how does he put it? Paraphrasing uh, Deleuze, one does not think without becoming otherwise. Truly thinking is not a matter of reproducing what we already know. Truly thinking is not a matter of recognizing or mirroring the same. Truly thinking is losing our boundaries. It is meeting a world that exceeds us. It is researching, performing inquiry with a world that is more than human, that exceeds us, that defeats us. During the pandemic, um, we, we've learned certain lessons collectively. And one of those lessons is that we live in a world that is complex and complexifying, entangled and entangling. Um, a world where a tiny, I shouldn't say tiny, a barely visible infinitesimal critter like a virus can upset entire economies. The world is uncertain. It's not just uncertain like we don't know it. The world is indeterminable. It is more than a question of gathering facts together to predict, you know, given some kind of futurist analysis of what might yet be. The world is so complex that it is more than human, more than our analysis can render intelligible. And this pandemic with the coronavirus stealing from bodies to bodies, traversing nation state boundaries, has taught us that we live in a world that is uncertain and indeterminable. And we have to learn to live here. We have to learn to live with a world that exceeds us. And there are many ways to do that. One is relinquishing our claims to mastery. You know, letting go of our ideas that we are at the top of our game, that we're confident about what comes next, and coming down to earth, which is what I think we must do. Learning to come down to earth, learning to listen to the world, learning to frame inquiry that expands our sociality, bringing in the modern human. We need to become, we need to flee or exile ourselves from the territory of the human. And I think it's only by doing so that we might come across multiple other framings of temporality, multiple other ways of being in the world, multiple other ways of framing and speaking about and enacting the future. At this certain time, at this present time, um, we run the risk of repeating all those things that we already know. Because this territory is sticky. This territory we call the human is very sticky. And it reinforces paradigms that we want to get rid of. So our task today is not merely to gather in a room and think, what are the innovative things we can do next? Because we tend to risk reinforcing and repeating the very dynamics that we want to escape. If we frame emancipation within the order of our oppression, which I name as the man or the human, then we risk proliferating our incarceration or repeating or reinforcing or strengthening our incarceration. This is why we need bricks. This is why we need sites of rupture. This is why we need to ask questions differently. Um, one of the ways we can do this is, is with work we've been developing over time, futures literacy, making sanctuary, Subjects that I cannot dwell upon within a 20 minute talk, but there are definitely things that we're being invited to do to unlearn mastery, to fall down to earth, and to make space for the new. This is the invitation of Abayami. 
This is the invitation of tricksters of our time. This is the invitation of explosions and eruptions. This is the invitation of Bakita, the slave woman who was found, you know, somewhere in that site of Valongo, who can still be visited at the IPN Museum, who is beckoning on us to embark on expeditions to the ground, to fall to the ground in acts of libation and prostration, to listen to the world again, to listen to ourselves, to listen to the modern human. Only by listening might we have a chance to steal away from the colonial repetitiveness, the toxic cyclicity of the future. Thank you for listening. Nossa, maravilhoso, né, esse material. Gente, assim, realmente muito desafiador pensar dessa forma, né? Como eu falei antes da nossa palestra, é, a gente fez também um grupo de perguntas. E agora você vai assistir as perguntas que foram selecionadas pelos nossos curadores. So I have some questions that have been curated by the organizers of um, the Possible Futures Festival uh, for me to answer. Um, um, I'll just go through them within a 10 minute space. The first one is how does the diversity of views allow us to build desirable futures? How does the diversity of views um, allow us to build desirable futures? Well, um, the way I respond to that is by noticing the homogeneous monopoly of ideas that we call the future. Um, if I invite everyone here or everyone listening to think about the future, um, what do you have in 2050? Um, some of us might name flying cars, reusable rocket ships, um, basically extensions of the present, iPhone 11 or iPhone 22, um, extensions of what we already know. Um, um, so I don't think diversity of views um, or having a multiplicity of views is the issue here because you can still have diversity within a colonizing space. Um, as I like to say sometimes, um, the slave ship was very diverse. The slave ship had representation. There were more black bodies on slave ships than white bodies. Um, and yet it was a vessel of oppression. Diversity is beautiful and invited, but diversity in itself could be a diversity of the same, a proliferation of the same or reiteration of the same. What I would invite us to notice instead is how or to reframe or to re-ask is instead of how do we just have a diversity of views, um, but how do we encourage rupture, errancy? How do we encourage transversality? How do we lean into moments where the impossible thrives, where things that are unsaid, things that are so new so unprecedented can meet us because if we can frame the yet to come in words that we can understand then it isn't new after all it isn't as novel as we think it is the question then is uh, not how to capture the future in a series of diverse expli um, explicitations of what might yet be but how do we co-create spaces um, and this is what I'm saying is not an abandonment of diversity, but I'm deepening the desire here. How do we expand upon the diversity? How do we go in from just saying inclusivity and exclusivity to fugitivity? How do we encourage or perform um, a proliferation of the modern human views that might want to be heard? How do we sit in an alien planet? and listen? How do we wrestle with the yet to come and encourage the wrestling, not as a weakness,
but as the kind of ethical space that is encouraged when we see ourselves as part of a web of life instead of transcendent above it. Okay, so the next question is, I think I'm doing well for time, is uh, how to integrate different and opposite views in the construction of these futures? Beautiful question. Integration runs a risk of repeating the familiar. Um, as a clinical psychologist working in Nigeria, one of the sentiments, uh, one of the very prominent and powerful discourses um, in that space um, was how do we integrate traditional psychotherapy with Western styled psychotherapy? How do we integrate it? And it seems like a well-intentioned, you know, thing to do. Let's integrate it. Let's bring them together. But you see, there are power dynamics that emerge when integration is the only solution. When we think about integration as the way to go, because um, sometimes integration is a code word for sublimation or uh, um, that's not the word I'm looking for for domination um, and and the less prestigious um, partner in an integration proce um, process is usually just subsumed eaten up or made to conform quite violently to a particular way of processing in this case psychotherapy or healing or well-being so it's not so much a matter of integration for me because integration is, um, I think integration um, is sympathetic to an optic phenomenon that might be called reflection. Um, it's about a search for the same. It's about a search for synthesis. I would instead urge diffraction along the lines of people who have been speaking about diffraction like Donna Haraway, Karen Barad, for some time now, that what we want to do is to appreciate and notice di differences, you know. Um, how do we allow for differences to, to thrive? Um, um, how do we allow for opposite, even um, uh, conspiratorial, um, controversial notions of what might yet be to thrive in the same space? Because when we think in terms of diffraction, not opposition, when we think in terms of diffraction, not reflection, then we want to notice how patterns emerge. And we want to go in the streams of, that, of those patternings and then play with them and see what might happen. Um, so for me, it's not a question of integrating, which is synthesis for me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different methodology here, diffraction, um, allowing things to differentiate themselves and allowing that even opposite contradictory views you know to thrive and see where that might take us have a few more minutes what can companies and people do to deconstruct patterns and imagine other possible futures hmm. i think i think industries are met with a challenge today uh, an ironic challenge you know, the question usually emerges, what can we do to fulfill our goals? I think in the Anthropocene, meeting industries and companies, meeting your objectives might actually be part of the problem. How does meeting our objectives become a problem or become problematic? Well, I think we're now in a time where we need to think differently. Um, where we need unprecedented forms of organizing ourselves that might strike at the heart of some of our organizations and the ways we framed ourselves, the way we framed our algorithms, the ways we framed our objectives. For instance, an organization that is committed to the phenomenon of climate justice might frame climate justice in palatable ways, reducing it to, say, carbon emissions reducing it to getting the word out or educating people about climate justice. And I feel the trickster archetype is very present in these times and inviting us to expand on these notions. 
not to stay within the familiar spaces of our objectives, but to spill away from that, you know, to become different. And this is where I feel some work needs to happen. Um, I could speak about some of the methodologies, but there isn't some time to do that. Um, but definitely in terms of meeting challenges and meeting obstacles, diffraction, diffracting um, our expectations and readings and insights and practices, um, allowing for the new to emerge. You know, if organizations were framed around this, it might leave us the opportunity, afford us some space to do some different things, shocking things. It might allow us to seek funding in different ways. It might allow us to frame our objectives in ways that may not actually be funded. Uh, it might allow us to do, uh, to meet, um, to build coalitions differently. It might allow us to frame our goals entirely different. So this is maybe an invitation, a post-humanist invitation for, invitation for organizations to spill away from the human territory and to start to expand what it means to be an organization in the midst of ruins and the Anthropocene. Um, and finally, how can companies contribute to expanding future prospects? I think I've answered that question. Um, um, our work now is to, is to become different, is to shape shift. Our work now is to listen to the trickster. Our work now is, is decolonial, deeply decolonial. Um, we risk repeating the things that we think we're leaving behind when we um, situate ourselves only within a humanocentric paradigm of inclusivity, diversity, and exclusivity. Those things are necessary concepts. But in order to burst open into the unexpected, in order to frame a politics of surprise, we might have to do entirely new things. Um, and these new things are not new in the sense of abandoning the things that we're already doing. They're not superior. They're not deeper. They're fugitive expressions of what we're already doing. Um, but they might afford us a space of meeting the world and allowing ourselves to be met by the world in different ways. I thank you for sharing these questions with me. I hope I've been able to tackle some of them in ways that are upsetting and intelligible to you all at once. Thank you, and I hope that the festival goes well and defeats your expectations. Um, thank you very much, and goodbye. Muito bom, gente. Ele comentou ali no final, né, que ele esperava que tenha que, que, a, que a palestra dele tenha sido tivesse sido legal, né, que não tivesse sido chata. Realmente não teve nada de chato. Pelo contrário, muito desafiador pensar dessa forma. Que oportunidade maravilhosa, né, a gente poder ouvir esses pensamentos e acho que realmente a gente só tem a crescer quando a gente ouve e dá espaço para diversidade. Minha gente, esse esse conteúdo aqui está chegando ao final, mas a gente ainda tem programação. Então, novamente, te convido a sair desse link e voltar para o nosso hot site e acessar o próximo conteúdo. E daqui a mais ou menos um minutinho, a gente está de volta com mais programação. Obrigada pela sua companhia e até daqui a pouquinho.